But I get to introduce a very dear friend, Shay Centermeyer. I, I know many of you could say the same thing. I, I look out the audience, I know many of you have known Chase for a number of years, so we're, we're so pleased to have him here. He could have come and spoken uh, a number of times, but one of the reasons uh, he's here is he's just written this wonderful book, When Things Went Right, and by pure coincidence, it's for sale outside, and uh, he's trying to get on the top 10 list of the New York Times, so I'm sure he will sign it for you after, uh, afterwards if, uh, if you buy a copy. I have, a, this is, actually this is my copy, I borrowed a copy, but I have, I have a signed copy. So it, it, it's a story of, uh, he'll talk to you about it, about when things went right when he joined the Reagan-Bush administration. So I'm gonna give a very brief, because I don't wanna steal his remark introduction. Chase has done so many great things, um, he got here as soon as he could. He went to Harvard. Uh, he was with the Houston Chronicle, uh, Post Chronicle, Houston Chronicle, served in the state legislature. But the, probably the most important thing he did as a student, he, he worked for uh, the candidate for the U.S. Congress, George Bush. Uh, President Bush, 41, became his mentor. He followed him in a number of different areas, including to, to Washington when he became part of the Reagan administration. But two things about Asia, uh, uh, just three things and then I'll turn it over to Chase. I've always been uh, so impressed with, uh, with the fact that Chase uh, participated in, in really two, uh, two very, and maybe, maybe you're gonna talk about that, two signature events. One, when President Bush was out of office in the late 70s, he had a chance uh, to be one of the first visitors to Tibet along with Secretary of State Jim Baker and Lowell, the famous uh, traveler Lowell Thomas. And so what a crew, and, uh, and Chase got to travel early on uh, to Tibet and China at a time in the late 70s, very few people were going to China and nobody was going to Tibet uh, at all. So they saw a world that very few people didn't. And their interpreter became a very close friend of Chase, and he went on to hold many important positions in the government of, of uh, China, including the, uh, until recently was the foreign minister, and now he's state counselor, even above the foreign minister. And secondly, at a time of critical relations in U.S. Uh, China relations, right after Tiananmen Square, Chase was able to go with uh, then the national security advisor, uh, Brent Scowcroft, to on a secret mission to China to meet with Deng Xiaoping in order to reassure the Chinese government. I hope I didn't steal your speech. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Chase Sa oh, sorry. Well, thank you, Charles, and thank everybody here at Asia Society for the compliment of this evening. Uh, it is related to the book that Charles was very kind to promote and I will, of course, be delighted to uh, sign copies afterwards. Uh, I might add that all the proceeds go to a very worthy organization, the George Bush School of Public Affairs at Texas A&M. I feel like uh, that uh, institution uh, really deserves whatever I might gain from the sale of the book because, after all, everything that's in it resulted from the kindness and trust uh, placed in me by George Bush over those many years. I'll touch on that. In fact, I will touch on some of the Asian-related items in the book, but what I mostly am uh, celebrating tonight was the breadth of the topic which uh, John Bradshaw or Bana was kind to give to tonight's talk, namely reflections on Asia. And the reason I embrace that is that I do have a long view with regard to that part of the world and therefore welcome tonight's opportunity to share some of those recollections, a few of which are spelled out in the book, but uh, you'll see that it begins much, much earlier than even 1981. You know, as a youngster growing up here in Houston, uh, my family was not poor, but it wasn't able to afford foreign travel. And in those years, the 1950s and into the 1960s, foreign travel meant only one place, and that was Europe. I was a French student, and it would have been nice to go to France and practice some of it, but that was just not financially feasible. So as a result, I bided my time until such opportunity to travel came along. I truly envy and admire the young people of today for whom foreign travel is something they do routinely 
and it happens uh, uh, for high school students, let alone for uh, university students. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that all educated Americans first and last go to Europe. And that was the obvious destination for people who were of European ancestry, who studied European languages, who studied the history of art, meaning Western art. And that would have been nice, but unfortunately, it didn't come to happen. And many years later, I happened to read uh, the great uh, work of Evelyn Wall, Brideshead Revisited, in which his protagonist, Charles Ryder, says this, Europe could wait. There would be time for Europe. All too soon the days would come when I needed a man at my side to put up my easel and carry my paints, when I could not venture more than an hour's journey from a good hotel, when I needed soft breezes and mellow sunshine all day long. Then I would take my old eyes to Germany and Italy. Now, while I still had the strength, I would go to the wild lands where man had deserted his post and the jungle was creeping back to its old strongholds. Well, that meant Asia. But Asia was even more remote from my possible visit than Europe at that particular point in my life. And I had to see or, uh, or experience Asia only secondhand through such people as I was fortunate to take a course from, uh, the late Professor Edwin Reischauer at Harvard, who was ambassador to Japan during the Kennedy administration. Now, my problem and my longing was uh, resolved by something called the Vietnam War. And uh, during that particular period, I joined the US Navy, was commissioned an officer, and my very first trip across an ocean was the Pacific, not the Atlantic, to join my ship in Japan. The ship, a very aged uh, World War II era destroyer, limped around uh, the east and uh, littoral of Asia. I got to see Hong Kong and Subic Bay in the Philippines enough to begin to excite my taste for adventure in that part of the world. The real opportunity, though, came several months later when on an afternoon, to my great surprise, I was called into the uh, cabin of the executive officer who had a flimsy cable from the personnel bureau in Washington announcing that I would be assigned as aide to the admiral in command of US naval forces in the Philippines. This happened to have been a man whom I knew. He had been the superintendent of the Naval Academy. He was the brother-in-law of Prescott Bush Jr., the brother of then Congressman George Bush. So I had gotten to know that particular family and in fact had uh, dated his daughter at one point. I always suspected that my orders were, were with more romantic intention than naval intention. But whatever it was, off I went to join his staff as uh, his aide in Sangley Point, a small naval air station, a fast boat ride across Manila Bay from Manila. I was a terrible aide. I will not go into the horrors of my failure to uh, do the right uh, honors to the, to the admiral. But all I can say is I remain grateful to him in heaven for letting me have that exposure to not just Asia, but to another, uh, just being outside of the United States, my first real chance to live abroad. The job that Admiral Kaufman, Draper Kaufman, had as commander of US Naval Forces Philippines was not an operational command. It was truly a diplomatic job. His primary responsibility was to represent the Commander-in-Chief Pacific, the commander of all US military forces in the Pacific, including the Vietnam era, area. Uh, uh, even though he was uh, a uh, four-star admiral, the late John McCain Jr., father of Senator McCain, uh, his uh, command was uh, embraced all of the military services. The Philippines was very important to the US military effort in that part of the world, especially during the Vietnam War with Subic Bay and the Clark Air Base. Admiral McCain frequently visited our little naval air station, and as a result of his other duties, Admiral Kaufman had responsibilities relating to the Philippine government, the Philippine Armed Forces. It was, in many ways, a marvelous preparation for a 24-year-old to one day become an ambassador, because the, the links were with the Philippine government and with the US Embassy across the, the bay in Manila. Also, I was able to travel with Admiral Kaufman on some of his inspection trips around Southeast Asia and as far as Charles Foster's Thailand. And on leave, I was able to hop military planes and get to explore more of Japan and Korea and Thailand in those uh, particular days. Well, the, the flavor of this opportunity to travel 
was such that I arranged for my discharge from the Navy to be in Manila, not back in the United States, because I wanted to use the Philippines as a wonderful jumping off place to begin really exploring Asia and eventually Africa in ways that even uh, in uh, courtesy of the US Navy, I was not able to do. So I got my discharge in Manila and I embarked on what became a 16 month journey through Asia and Africa. Now, I commend the 24, 25 year old me for realizing that that was the right time of life to do something like that, when 16 months would be too short a time to travel, and today 16 days is too long to travel. But uh, I was filled with the spirit of uh, something else written by Evelyn Waugh, and I'm glad to notice in the audience tonight my friend Larry Meyer, because he was the one who lent me a uh, copy of, of his, his copy of Evelyn Waugh's wonderful collection of travel stories called When the Going Was Good. And uh, Evelyn Waugh in the introduction to this collection of wonderful stories, which I recommend to you, I've read it many times since that initial time, uh, said, we have, most of us, marched and made camp, gone hungry and thirsty, lived where pistols are flourished and fired. At that time, it seemed an ordeal an initiation to manhood. I was simply a young man, typical of my age. We traveled as a matter of course. I rejoice that I went when the going was good. Well, Wall was talking about the 1920s and 1930s. I could not have traveled in those years. I had to deal with the late 1960s and 70s, and yet it was a very good time to go when the going was good because some of the places I was able to travel to, such as northwest part of Pakistan and into Afghanistan, uh, the southern Philippines are not advised for travel these days, and I fear to say it may be many, many years before people can enjoy the freedom of traveling and getting to know people in that part of the world as I did. You know, the southern Philippines is absolutely the most beautiful collection of tropic islands imaginable in any part of the Pacific, and yet those are the places where a very vicious uh, Islamist group is uh, looking out especially for uh, Americans and American tourists. One of the joys of my journey of, of the 16 months involving Asia was taking a, a, a trip to the back door of the Philippines, as they call it, out the islands uh, in the Sulu chain toward East Malaysia to uh, uh, what used to be called North Borneo uh, and is the uh, easternmost part of Malaysia. On that uh, journey, I rode a smuggler's boat. Now, the smuggling was done coming back to the Philippines. Going to Malaysia was not smuggling, but it was just transport. I think the cargo was a load of dried seahorses, which has some uh, aphrodisiac qualities, I am informed, in Chinese medicine. Whatever it was, that was the cargo. And nothing could be more delightful than to use that as my means of uh, arriving in Malaysia. Much later, in another part of the neighborhood, I decided that what I wanted to do was to go from one end of Sumatra to the other. Not a very easy journey, maybe even so today. I figured it would be necessary to cover some of that vast distance, Sumatra being about the size of California, by air. But it was Ramadan, it was the rainy season, and I was told I would have to wait two weeks to get a seat on the airplane to cover a bit of distance from uh, from, uh, from uh, one end of uh, Sumatra to the other. The only alternative was to take a bus. If the bus was to leave from a, a jungle town, it would be five days and five nights through the jungle to get to the destination that I had originally hoped to fly to. Well, I was only on the bus for about eight hours because in the middle of the night during a rain, uh, it went off a bridge into a river. Now, there were 40 people on board the bus, only 10 of us uh, got out. And so I could have uh, ended my life in Asia and not be able to tell you this story had it turned out differently. But I'm glad to say that that was just the beginning of another remarkable adventure for which I don't have time tonight to go into, but uh, I was picked up by two officers of the Indonesian Air Force and rode with them through the jungles, getting back to a town of some size where I was able to pick up my journey, continue up the coast by boat, and eventually reach the top, uh, Banda Aceh, in Sumatra and complete that particular mission. Later, I did uh, go down the coast of West Malaysia, the old Malayan Peninsula, to Singapore, flew to uh, Sri Lanka, look around that place, and then enter India from the south in the most uh, exotic, the most Hindu part of all of India, 
uh, which is a way that very few people ever uh, enter India. Most Westerners, of course, go through Bombay or from, through Delhi, but I got to come in the back door, if you will, of India. I will spare the rest of the journey because uh, it largely took place in, uh, uh, in Africa. But when I returned to Houston to go to work for the Houston Chronicle in the early 1970s, I truly did not leave the United States for the next six years. That's an amazing or appalling thought today, but once again, that was the nature of life in those years. I did make one quick trip to Belize, but that was the only place outside the United States I went until one day, it happened to be the day that Elvis Presley died, so every time it's Elvis's death's anniversary, I remember the day in 1977 when I got a call from George Bush, then out of office, the former director of Central Intelligence, with whom I was working as ghostwriter on some memoirs. This would be the uh, account of his time as a congressman, as ambassador to the United Nations, as envoy to the People's Republic of China, and as director of CIA. Uh, we worked together on that project at the Bush Place in Maine, and that would have been a thrill by itself just to be in that beautiful place for a couple of weeks. But coming back from Maine, I'm picking up the phone on that particular day that poor Elvis went to his reward, or so it is alleged, uh, he said that he had been invited by the Chinese government to return to China. It was going to be their first return to the People's Republic after he left there as the US envoy. In those days, people could not just buy a ticket and go to China. You had to be invited by either the Chinese government as part of a delegation, or you were invited by someone resident in China, such as a diplomat. Uh, Vice, uh, or George Bush, at that time, ex-Ambassador uh, Bush, was told he could put together a delegation. Uh, Charles Foster mentioned some of the people in that group. I've often said that to go to Beaumont with that group would have been the trip of a lifetime, but to go to China, and including Tibet, was uh, even more spectacular. I'm glad to say that in the telling, of this story by people like Barbara Bush, that uh, that trip meant as much to them and people of, of that kind of experience as world travelers and as uh, keepers of the company of world figures, uh, if, it, if that trip mattered as much to people like George and Barbara Bush, you can imagine how much it, it mattered to me. But just to mention some of the other people who were in our group, there was Jim Baker, who at the time was Houston lawyer, former Under Secretary of Commerce, and not long thereafter, a unsuccessful candidate for Attorney General of Texas. There was uh, Lowell Thomas, the man who in 1918 discovered this uh, eccentric Englishman on the uh, Hejazi Desert of Arabia who uh, was leading or helping to lead the revolt of the Arab people against the Turks, Lawrence of Arabia. And after becoming famous in 1918, 1919, Lowell Thomas got to know everybody of consequence in the 20th century. I had the pleasure of knowing him when he was in his mid-80s and deep into what he liked to call his anecdotage. And uh, I have sensed some of that uh, at work tonight. I apologize, but uh, what could be more delightful than to do something like go to Tibet with the man, Lowell Thomas, who was the last Westerner to be in Tibet before the uh, Chinese uh, took over that country in 1950. We uh, had the benefit of lots of time on the Yangtze River as well, and Many a great story, many a great uh, time came from knowing him. When he died four years later, I was shocked because at age 89, I could not imagine he would go leave us that soon. But uh, that was one of the many blessings of getting uh, on that trip. Another person on the trip was uh, Jim Lilly. Jim Lilly was career CIA. He was, in fact, the station chief in Beijing at the time George Bush was the chief of the US liaison office. He later became the US representative to Taiwan, ambassador to Korea, and ambassador to China at the time of Tiananmen, and so much else that happened. A marvelous individual uh, who uh, had come many times to Houston to attend Asia Society events, and I hope some of you had a chance to meet him and know him as well. And could go down the list of other people, David Broder, the dean of American political reporters was part of our group, Hugh Lidke, who was CEO of Pennzoil, was on uh, the trip. Uh, uh, as I say, it was a, a marvelous experience with a marvelous group of people. Well, uh, what Jim Baker and George Bush talked about out of my hearing on this trip to China was George Bush's running for president of the United States, a thought which even I as a Bush supporter thought was 
rather extreme, but uh, he and Baker planned out the campaign that eventually Baker ran in 1979-80 for George Bush to win the Republican nomination for president. Well, as we know, he fell short, but uh, fortunately was picked by Ronald Reagan to become vice president, and after the election of 1980, he, George Bush, Vice President-elect, asked me to join his staff in Washington. I was then a member of the state legislature representing the River Oaks, Tanglewood, Eastern Memorial Drive, Eastern Spring Branch area. I realized when this invitation came, it meant the end of whatever career I had in politics. So I tortured over the decision for two-tenths of a second before accepting and going off to Washington. This is now the time when we're talking about the book that uh, has been published because the book tells the tale of what it was like for me to go to Washington, something I'd always dreamed of doing, at what turned out to be a very historic time, very exciting time, and it would have been exciting to work for any president at any point, particularly in the environment which I found myself. The vice president had an office in the west wing of the White House. I had a cubbyhole. Uh, offshoot of his office, but it didn't matter, location, location, location after all, and it was only a 15 second walk down the hall to the Oval Office and less than five second walk next door to the Chief of Staff's office where Jim Baker held, uh, held sway, and uh, the rest of the White House world was immediately at hand. We didn't get to spend much time in the White House because Vice President Bush was extremely peripatetic. I, by myself, spent uh, uncounted hours and days of my life on Air Force Two, covering 350,000 miles in two years on 99 trips. And 10 of those trips were foreign trips, and two of those foreign trips were to Asia. And that's what I mentioned in the book. I'll, I'll briefly talk about what those experiences uh, in, entailed, but I, I encourage you to, uh, to read the detail. The first trip was to Manila, my old stomping ground, in June of 1981 for what would be the last inauguration of Ferdinand Marcos as president of the Philippines. He had been in power since 1965. There was a lot of doubt about the honesty of the election, to say the least, but the U.S. Senate delegation headed by the vice president to attend the inaugural. This, too, was a, another marvelous experience in terms of the people on the trip because in addition to George and Barbara Bush, uh, there was Claire Booth Luce, uh, one of the most famous Americans of her time, and uh, also, like Lowell Thomas, filled with the most marvelous imaginable stories, many of which were actually true, which uh, made it even better. So we traveled to Manila. Uh, the uh, uh, inauguration occurred uh, outdoors on a sweltering day. The American delegation was given uh, special attention, and as a result, immediately after the inauguration, only the American delegation was hosted by President and uh, Mrs. Marcos in Malacanang Palace. It was on this occasion that, well, a couple of memorable things happened. One is that we exchanged toasts and very thick, very sweet champagne, or whatever the proper name of that wine was, and Barbara Bush recounts how she lifted the glass to her lips only to have the governor of Iowa, Bob Ray, put his hand over the glass to keep her from drinking it. And she thought this was a very rude gesture by a very kind man until she saw the rather large fly that was doing a backstroke in the thick wine, enjoying it greatly. Uh, in fact, I think only the flies enjoyed that particular meal. Uh, the press was brought in and uh, in time to hear the vice president toast Ferdinand Marcos and his adherence to democracy and democratic principles. Uh, this became a cause celebre, especially in the United States, but uh, we presume also in the Philippines. It encouraged President Marcos to think that he had the Reagan administration in his pocket. This proved to be all the more disappointing to him when five years later the people power revolution began and it uh, overthrew him with the blessing of the Reagan administration. Uh, the rest of that story, which is uh, told in the exotica of its time, is that uh, President Mrs. Marcos very much wanted to make sure that the American delegation was uh, given every possible comfort. The trouble was that a typhoon was heading uh, upon Manila at the time, and we got out of town as quickly as we could. Part of the difficulty for Claire Booth Luce and clearing out was that Imelda Marcos gave her an immense basket filled with perfumes and chocolates and all kinds of other trinkets to be remembered in Manila. 
Well, the next year, in the spring of 1982, uh, Vice President Bush made another swing around Asia, this time uh, to several countries. The first was to Japan, uh, always usually the first stop American presidents, vice presidents make in Asia. The special treat of that time was to be invited to have lunch with Emperor Hirohito in the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. This is described in, in greater detail in my book than I'll be able to mention now. All I can say is that perhaps like many of you, I've been to Tokyo before and looked up at the vast imposing walls and moat of the Imperial Palace in Tokyo and wondered what life could possibly be like on the other side of that wall. Well, on this particular day, we found out by taking a motorcade uh, across the moat into uh, the opening in wall number one to find another moat and another wall, and then the Imperial Palace. The uh, emperor uh, was a very formal man, did not say much in any language, but uh, he was, uh, we were given all proper protocol training as to how to bow and what to say and to uh, keep conversation to a minimum. In fact, this proved to be particularly challenging for Mrs. Bush, who was seated next to the emperor during the luncheon that was held after the initial introductions and, uh, and bowing. She tried to stir up conversation with him and uh, found that he only had about three short answers to anything that she said or asked, and that would be yes, no, and thank you. And out of desperation, at one point, she noted the surroundings of this rather beautiful, modern, but traditionally styled Japanese building, and said uh, how beautiful it was. And the emperor said, uh, thank you. And then she said, it looks new. And the emperor said, yes. And then Mrs. Bush said, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, was there a, another building? He said, yes, an older building, yes. And then she asked, well, what happened to it? And the emperor then looked at her and said, I'm afraid you bombed it. <laughs> this, this, unfortunately, I did not get to personally hear that exchange. I borrowed it from Barbara Bush's own book, but it is too great a story. Our journey continued on, eventually got to Singapore, where one of the people I've most admired in all the world, Lee Kuan Yew, was the host of the vice president giving a dinner at the Astana, the palace uh, in Singapore. Uh, that was the beginning of an ongoing relationship between uh, Lee Kuan Yew and George Bush that led to many other visits uh, and the various stages of Lee Kuan Yew's life and career. Uh, and thanks to an introduction from then ex-President Bush, I had a chance to have my own visit with Lee Kuan Yew in the Astana many years ago on a World Affairs Council trip to Singapore. We also were uh, well advanced on this trip, in fact it was in Singapore, when finally the invitation came from the Chinese government for Vice President Bush to come to Beijing. We continued on to uh, Australia, New Zealand, and then on a very, very long day, flew from Wellington, New Zealand, to Hangzhou in China, uh, central South China, right on the famous West Lake, and uh, recovered from the long journey there before proceeding on to Beijing. And that's where uh, Vice President had very long meetings with his old friend, Deng Xiaoping. Now, I should mention that when George Bush was the U.S. liaison officer in Beijing, which essentially was only for one year, the year being 1975, Deng Xiaoping had been brought back from his uh, banishment during the Cultural Revolution because Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai recognized that here was a man of great skill and great talent and toughness in governing. He was, therefore, the person uh, that George Bush got to know best when he represented the United States. He couldn't see Zhou Enlai or Mao Zedong on a regular basis, but he did see Deng Xiaoping, and that proved to be much more uh, consequential in developing that relationship. In between the time that George Bush was the U.S. liaison office, uh, officer and our return in 1977 on the trip I previously described, uh, Deng Xiaoping had been once again uh, rusticated by the so-called Gang of Four. But he was brought back after the Gang of Four was smashed. That was the operative word we learned on that trip. Uh, the Gang of Four was not defeated, it wasn't ousted, it wasn't sent away, it was smashed. And after the smashing of the Gang of Four, Deng Xiaoping uh, zoomed power and held it until his death. In 1982, he was just beginning the great series of economic reforms that have 
has made China into, uh, once again, the world powerhouse it has been throughout history, but uh, latterly for the last century or so had not been. I really do think that when the true length of Chinese history is written, that Deng Xiaoping will stand out as a much more, uh, a much greater figure than Mao, because he was a man who contributed uh, to the, the growth, the building, and the enriching of China, rather than to repeated destructions and internal dis, uh, dissent, uh, disintegration that uh, Mao oversaw in the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. Uh, the main focus of the US and Chinese discussions at the time dealt with the question of military aid to Taiwan. Uh, the Chinese wanted the Bush visit to be conclusive on that point, but Bush was very sensitive to the fact that he was not there to negotiate. And besides, there was this very prickly gentleman named Alexander Haig, who was the US Secretary of State and who insisted on governing such things, not leaving it to the Vice President. So uh, in what became a, a little bit uncomfortable uh, aspect of our visit in April of 82 was that Bush kept delaying the uh, discussion of the issue that the Chinese cared most about, namely arms sales to Taiwan, but he was able to get out of town without uh, any great excoriation on the part of the Chinese. And later, Alexander Haig was able to go to Beijing and reach an agreement in August of 1982, which basically said the United States would taper off its arms sales to Taiwan over time uh, to, and to disappear at some point in the future. It uh, goes without saying that it's now uh, 32 years later, the United States is still selling arms to Taiwan and uh, whatever impact the Hague Agreement had has been less uh, impactful, if you will, on the security of Taiwan than was imagined at the time. In fact, uh, it's a subject for somebody else to speak rather than myself, but with regard to Chinese preoccupation with Taiwan, all I can say is that as a result of the cl very close economic ties between uh, Taiwan and the mainland, that I won't say that the tensions have disappeared in that part of the world, but they certainly have been vastly reduced, notwithstanding the fact that the United States military support of Taiwan remains undiminished. When Diana and I had a chance to visit Taiwan in, uh, excuse me, uh, visit the mainland in the fall of uh, 2012, uh, Taiwan was almost not mentioned at all. There was a lot of talk about this uh, Dayu Islands and uh, other regional conflict but Taiwan was not mentioned a bit, which was quite unusual for anybody who had gone to China for decades before and been given the standard talking to about why the United States was uh, insulting China by continuing to support a breakaway province. In concluding this, let me just mention uh, a little bit of what Charles talked about, and that was that when George Bush became president in 1989, my duties were very definitely domestic. Uh, they were uh, housed in the west wing of the White House, a place I almost never left. In fact, I almost never left the city of Washington during the first nine months of that administration because my job was to be the director of presidential personnel, trying to advise the president on all matter of appointments to all matter of, of government agencies. It, it had an international aspect in that, yes, some of those appointees were at the State Department and some were ambassadors, but that was uh, not my particular focus which is why I was most surprised one evening in December of 1981 to be told that the president wanted to see me in the Oval Office. And I didn't know what appointment uh, could possibly be about, uh, so I gathered up all my papers and went to the Oval Office. He asked me to sit down and to say that he had decided to send Brent Scowcroft and Lawrence Eagleburger, uh, Larry being the, under, uh, the Deputy Secretary of State, to Beijing to try to uh, restart the U.S.-Chinese uh, diplomatic relationship that had taken such a body blow as a result of the Tiananmen incident of that June. I was asked to go along on the trip to make contact with two people. One of them, uh, Charles also referred to, uh, Yang Jishur, or Tiger Yang, who at that time was a mid-level foreign ministry official dealing with the Sino-American relationship. And the other was Han Shu, who was the former Chinese ambassador to the United States, a man who had been right there when Henry Kissinger was first beginning the contacts uh, with China in 1971-72. Uh, my mission was to make contact with them to assure them that the United States under President Bush was going to uh, consider the Chinese relationship to be very valuable, that 
our concerns over human rights and the lack of freedom on the part of the Chinese people was a, a genuine one, but that we considered the overall strategic relationship to be very valuable and not one to be lost. Meanwhile, of course, uh, Brent Scowcroft and Larry Eagleburger were talking to the Chinese foreign minister and to uh, other leading figures of the time. But I feel like I uh, was able to accomplish my mission in talking to a former ambassador, Han Xu, and a future ambassador, uh, Yang Zhishu. Yang Zhishu later became foreign minister and now state counselor of foreign affairs in China, I think largely propelled upward by his being uh, a friend and known to the Bush family for, for many decades. Uh, I might add that I also accomplished something in that I was able to go shopping with Sally Lilly, uh, the wife of Jim Lilly, the US ambassador. While he had his meetings, I had the time free and I was able to go to a particular place that Sally knew and to buy a small carpet that had actually been a uh, 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 saddle blanket for either a camel or a Mongolian pony in uh, the Qing dynasty period. And it was a nice throw rug that I brought back to give to Diana, who I proposed to at that time, Diana being a fellow White House staffer. She had not accepted, but uh, in the absence of her acceptance, I still brought a peace offering of this little rug. And I still to this day consider that uh, to be a significant moment because what Scowcroft and Eagleburger hoped would be that they could bring back on the airplane a man named Fang Lejeu, a Chinese dissident who had sought refuge in Jim Lilly's garden house and had been there since the time of Tiananmen. And it was hoped that as a sign of goodwill of the ongoing relationship, the Chinese would release Fang Lejeu to Scowcroft and Eagleburger and we take him back to the United States on the plane. Uh, it wasn't for many months later that he was released and he went to Canada. So I do believe every time I look at this little throw rug that it was the most substantive achievement of the Scowcroft and Eagle Burger mission to China. <laughs> now, uh, another Asian touching during the first Bush administration was that when Diana and I married, we uh, had to choose a place to go on our honeymoon. Diana's from Wyoming. She is in favor of those large things that stick out and jut into the sky called mountains, which we don't really know too much about here in Texas. But I figured that that would be uh, 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 something to consider in our honeymoon choice. So why not go to the mountains, to the Himalayas? At the time, our very good friend, friend of many people in this room, Julia Chang Block, was serving as ambassador in Nepal. She was, in fact, the first Asian American to be an ambassador anywhere. A great friend of mine, and she welcomed us to Kathmandu. And as a result of another great Asian American friend, uh, Sichan Siv, uh, a Cambodian American who now lives in San Antonio, uh, we decided that we would extend the trip on to Bhutan, where we spent a very memorable, magical week. We could have stayed longer, but uh, in the sense that the King was our official host and was willing to let us stay longer, that being a very rare and special privilege at that time. But we did have our jobs back in the White House, and all good things, including honeymoons, have to come to an end. So we left, but uh, that particular journey, which I hope to describe in the third volume of my book, uh, uh, that is, uh, number one is, exists, number two will tell about my experiences in the Pentagon, number three will tell about the first Bush administration, including our memorable honeymoon in that part of the world. Uh, the end of my time in the first Bush administration was as director of Voice of America, a marvelous institution, broadcasts in 15 languages, over 1,000 hours a week. It was a place to be global while still right there on Independence Avenue in Washington, D.C. Um, it was too short a time, unfortunately. I was there only 17 months before the tragic results of the 1992 election threw us all out on the sidewalk, and I had to give up uh, what I was able to gain through the workings of politics. Greatest regret is that if President Bush had been reelected, I would have stayed as Director of Voice of America and been able to go to the country that was considered most enthusiastic about VOA, may still be today, and that is Bangladesh. It's not a destination many people aim for, but I very much wanted to get there as Director of VOA, and unfortunately wasn't able to do that. Uh, during the Clinton and George W. Bush years, I was able to take two trips to Taiwan and make a trip uh, sponsored by Asia Society in New York to Japan to look into the Japanese educational system. I was then the chairman of the State Board of Education. I was asked to be part of that delegation. 
and for not that much more money, was able to take Diana and our seven-year-old daughter Ellie with us. She proved to be the absolute secret of the mission's success because Japanese uh, see Western adults quite a lot, but they very seldom see Western children. So she became absolute little rock star at the various Japanese schools that we happened to visit. She even had her own interpreter uh, in a lunch with her fellow first graders in a little elementary school in Wakayama, uh, just south of Kobe, and uh, was asked by the Japanese students such typically Japanese questions as, uh, what is your favorite flower? And do you eat rice? And uh, I'm glad to say she acquitted herself well in that particular in, in inspection. Well, with all of this Asian background, why is it that I became ambassador to Qatar in the Middle East? Well, I... <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, the answer is uh, the same answer that President Kennedy gave when somebody once asked him how he became a war hero. And he answered, they sank my boat. And I view that as a similar sort of circumstance where something unplanned, unimagined, was a telephone call from the White House to my desk at the Texas Medical Center at the time asking if I would be ambassador to Qatar. It happened to be a vacancy. It happened to be something that the director of presidential personnel and George W. Bush thought might be a right place to go. And of course, I said yes. Uh, Diana also uh, consented to doing that. And it turned out to be a great uh, experience worthy of another visit here another day, except for the fact that Asia society has never recognized any place west of Iran as part of Asia. Uh, now, I remember in my third grade class taking out my yellow pencil and shading in the Arabian Peninsula as part of Asia, which it is. But Asia society uh, has drawn the line right at the border of Iran, and everything else is Middle East and somebody else's uh, or some other organization's concern, but not, uh, not part of Asia society. So. I bring my uh, comments to a close, other than to say that while I was ambassador in Doha, I sort of fell in with the Asian ambassadors group. And uh, that was something I was happy to do because many of them were such delightful people, especially the ambassador of Bangladesh and the ambassador of China, uh, Yue Zhaoyong, who is the husband of Madame Zhu Erwen, whom many of you know is our wonderful Chinese consul general here in Houston. Ambassador Yue and I became good friends. He later became ambassador to Jordan. He's now on another assignment back at the foreign ministry. But I particularly wanted to help the Asian ambassadors because uh, not China, of course, but uh, the countries represented by my colleagues from Philippines, Nepal, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka provided a great deal of the low wage labor in Qatar as they do in other parts of the Persian Gulf area. Their working and uh, pay conditions were uh, appalling. They still are not terrific, but it has vastly improved over the past decade. And as the American ambassador, I had the regular access to the foreign minister and the foreign ministry that they could not. And I felt this was something I could do to speak up for the plight of low-wage Asian labor in that country. And I like to think it at least led to a stirring of uh, changes in the way that, that low-wage labor was cared for. At one point, the labor attaché of the Nepali embassy said that he had very good news that now uh, the typical Nepali uh, worker was not paid for four months instead of nine months. So there had been great improvement. Um, the, one of the things, of course, you learn in the Middle East uh, is an appreciation for the Quran and the sayings of the Prophet. And one of the sayings of the Prophet was, seek knowledge even unto China. And what he was saying, of course, is that in those days, in the seventh century, to make a journey to China took years. It took Marco Polo and his brothers two or three years to get from Venice to uh, the court of Kublai Khan. And uh, therefore, to go unto China was a, another way of saying, uh, seek knowledge to the farthest extent that you can possibly imagine, you can possibly endure, and can possibly physically make possible. Well, as I've hoped these remarks have made clear, that my own figurative and literal journey to China has been uh, so much a part of my life in enrichment, in terms of knowledge, in terms of people met, and definitely in terms of experience. And I am so grateful to you all and to Asia Society for letting me share some of these reflections on Asia with you tonight. We have time for some questions. If 
Anyone? Not sure the microphone's necessary, but it's good to have. Um, hi. Uh, I, I was wondering, do you, uh, you, the title of your book is... Uh, <laughs> when Things, when went, things right. went Right. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I take that as a double entendre. Uh, first, when things were correct, became correct, and also when things became conservative. Is that, am I right about You're quite that? right. That is a double entendre intended with the title. Uh, and I, I didn't do it for partisan reasons, but I do believe uh, that in that time that the U.S. was governed the correct way. It was not a time without partisanship. It was not a time without criticism. There are many uh, rather stinging things that were said about President Reagan. But as I try to summarize at the end of the book, there were certain things that he did that unfortunately we've sort of lost the habit of doing in American government. This idea of talking to the other side or working with the other side, that it is uh, somehow, uh, in the opinion of many people, a betrayal of principle to compromise. Whereas President Reagan was very clear in saying that if he could get 70 or 80 percent of what he wanted, he counted that as a great victory that it, uh, if President Reagan was willing to compromise and give up something in order to get much of what he wanted and move his agenda forward, then that was an achievement uh, worth celebrating, not considering, as unfortunately many people today would consider that to be a betrayal of principle. So, so my follow-up question is, would you consider President George W. Bush a conservative? <clears throat> well, yes, he was not as conservative as many people in the Republican Party wanted him to be, uh, and that uh, surprised many people on the left. Uh, he certainly was conservative in the operative way that a Texas Republican is in believing in small government and less regulation, lower taxes, and generally uh, supporting state and local government over the federal government. I would say the one least conservative thing that he did as president was uh, to champion the so-called No Child Left Behind law, which gave the federal government a much greater role in public education than has historically had been the case. Uh, as a governor who had promoted a, an education reform agenda here in Texas, he clearly knew and appreciated the role of state and local governments historically in the United States when it comes to public education K through 12. But he believed so much in the idea of standards and uh, keeping schools accountable to those standards that that formulated uh, the so-called No Child Left Behind law that was enacted uh, during his first year as president. It proved to be so tough that it's been observed in the breach, sorry to say, over time, and states and localities that have not lived up to the standards envisioned by No Child Left Behind have been given exemptions and uh, extra time to comply that unfortunately has led to uh, missing the entire point of that law. Oh. You, you mentioned the Ambassador Rush Hour as a model. Were there other academic or influential people that uh, uh, shaped your thinking on Asia, or was so much of it just what you learned in doing it at the time? Well, uh, uh, unfortunately, and I think back on that time as a time I should have taken other courses than what I did, I could have taken the course by uh, Professor John K. Fairbanks, the great China scholar of his time at Harvard. He was nearing retirement, but he was still very much active. Uh, uh, but uh, I didn't. I was not uh, majoring in, in history. I was a government major. And in fact, the course that I took uh, from Professor Reichauer was uh, uh, elective to uh, fill things out. I'm very glad I did because he was a man of great breadth, uh, great knowledge, great uh, kindliness. Uh, his own personal story, uh, not just uh, his scholarship and his being an ambassador, but the fact that he was married to a woman who was the descendant of one of the early leaders of the Meiji Revolution uh, in Japan. So uh, I, I just found that a very eye-opening experience. I would like to wind back the clock and uh, take different courses and maybe major in something else, but I'm glad I did that. And in fact, I found that when I finally got to Tokyo, the question that was always in my mind, a kind of a ridiculous question, but it was there, was what would Professor Reichauer want me to see? And uh, it was all good, and I'm sure he would have felt that way. Chase. 
Oh, right there. <laughs> you didn't tell the story about having lunch with uh, Prince Sienna. You told oh. me about years ago. Why don't you share that with the uh, audience? Yes, well, there's too many stories, but what uh, you're kind to, uh, Jacqueline's kind enough to recall is that when I left Doha as ambassador in 2007, I was able to go east toward home rather than west through Europe, which is the way still uh, we get to and from Qatar. The reason I wanted to go east was that Sichan Siv, who I uh, referred to, a most remarkable individual whose book about his experiences escaping the killing fields in Cambodia called Golden Bones is uh, much to be recommended and, uh, and definitely an exciting tale. Uh, because of his experiences of going from the killing fields to come to the United States as a refugee to make his way in the United States up the ladder economically but also politically to the point that he became uh, one of the senior staff for President Bush the first and for President Bush the second became one of our ambassadors to the US delegation of the United Nations. He therefore is a very very prominent maybe the prominent Cambodian American, or at least he will be considered so till Bana Cole reaches that level herself. But uh, Sichan certainly was well known and well regarded by King Sihanouk, who in, in 2007 was no longer the reigning monarch. He had stepped aside in favor of his son, but was still uh, highly revered and uh, had uh, rather nice accommodations in the palace in Phnom Penh. He invited Sichan and Martha Siv to lunch, and they were able to bring a group of others that included me and uh, the Chargé d'Affaires of the U.S. Embassy in Cambodia. That was uh, quite special. It was all videotaped. Uh, that's something that we uh, invite you over to our place any time to see. It was uh, the entire thing from arrival to presentation of gifts to sitting down before lunch and talking to lunch and the talking during lunch and then the presentation of gifts after lunch uh, is all uh, captured uh, on video, which uh, does uh, is a, a marvelous way of capturing the personality of Sihanouk, who was uh, a man uh, of uh, immense charm, of great imagination, of great artistic interest. He was a filmmaker. In fact, that was uh, His Majesty's gift to each of us, was a package of video cassettes of his movies. And uh, so we can have uh, our own film festival any time. Uh, but uh, that uh, is a short version of a very uh, memorable times. Uh, Sihanouk died about, uh, as I recall, three years later, and uh, is, is still uh, highly revered. Any other questions? Just, I just wanted to mention that Ambassador Siv will be here April 22nd at the Asia Society. Oh, yes. So we'll have to see you all there. We should all be here for that. Well, if there are no other questions, I will be uh, delighted in thanking you all for coming once more.